And so let's start today's video with a somewhat bizarre picture. Look, it's an elephant. Um, but where exactly is this? And I guess why exactly is this? Well, obviously this is a 3D printed elephant inside a cell. Um, yeah. So today we're going to be diving into a really fascinating topic that intersects microtechnology with biology and some of the most incredible advances in 3D printing. Because as this image demonstrates, this is actually a 3D printed elephant inside the cell. And this wasn't just done for fun, this does have a lot of potential applications and shows us something very important. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss a relatively recent study you can find in the description on the two-photon 3D printing inside living cells, which has been physically created in a university in Slovenia. And so basically 3D printing at the most fundamental level of life. Which of course answers a super important question. What if we could 3D print functional devices inside a living cell? But I guess let's talk about specifics in a little bit more detail, starting of course with the idea of 3D printing. And the actual concept here is pretty straightforward. Building complex three-dimensional objects layer by layer, very often using some kind of a resin that eventually solidifies. But in more recent years, one type of 3D printing that became very popular started to use a technique where the polymerization or the hardening would usually be done by shining light. And in the last few years this became more important for printing on a very tiny scale. And so here we have this relatively recent technique referred to as TPP, two photon polymerization. A technique that uses a focused femtosecond laser to solidify various types of resins. Although here in order to solidify, a molecule has to absorb two photons simultaneously, which then hardens the resin. Here this often uses extremely fast lasers that start to produce pulses super fast in order to produce photons with slightly lower energy, but a lot of them at the same time. And here the technique uses photosensitive resin that hardens when exposed to light. But the light itself has to be quite intense and quite focused, which allows the production of incredibly fine detailed objects down to approximately 100 nanometers across. Here are just some of the examples produced previously. And technically this technique is not new to biological applications. For example, in some of the previous really really interesting studies, it has been used to print scaffolds for tissue growth around the cells, with more cells eventually added in order to produce larger tissue. And more recently this technique has also been demonstrated inside living organisms like in mice and in fruit flies. But this was done inside the organism and not inside the cell. As a matter of fact, prior to this study, there has not been any attempts to try to do this inside cells, with previous attempts only using processes like phagocytosis, or basically the cell swallowing something, in order to inject some kind of an object. And this is of course where this particular research becomes really exciting. This was led by Maru Samur and Matthias Humar, who made an incredible breakthrough. For the first time ever, they managed to fabricate a custom-shaped polymer or a custom shaped microstructure directly inside the cell itself. And as the images here show us, it was an elephant. A tiny 3D printed elephant created inside the cell directly. Here's roughly what this elephant looks like compared to the rest of the cell. And so I guess the question is, how did they do it? And here the process involved several key steps. First, a tiny droplet of a negative tone photoresist was injected inside a live HeLa cell. In this case, the HeLa cells are very often used in research and are basically sometimes referred to as immortalized cell lines. These are technically cells derived from various cancers, extracted from this patient, Henrietta Lacks, who eventually passed away from the disease. And over time these cells became used in research because they essentially represented a somewhat bizarre human cell line that just would not die, making them essential for a lot of different types of research although we'll actually discuss more about this in some of the future videos. Now for the second part, a commercial printing system, or a TPP system, equipped with the femtosecond laser, illuminated the droplet in a very specific pattern. And because here polymerization only occurs when the laser precisely hits the right spot, and when the intensity is sufficient enough, the structure would solidify only in very specific conditions. And so here, the third part was moving the focal point in a very precise manner, layer by layer, kind of similar to how a typical 3D printer would work. 
and this gradually formed a solid 3D structure inside the cell, with a structure resembling a tiny elephant. But at the end, the unpolymerized or liquid photoresist slowly dissolved outside of the cell and left no trace behind. And this dissolution is technically crucial. It shows that no additional harsh chemicals are going to be left inside the cell, and only the structure itself remained. In essence, suggesting that technically this could be a relatively safe procedure. But there was obviously a major challenge. Here, the researchers had to find the right photoresist. It was not enough for the material to be biocompatible once polymerized, it had to be biocompatible when it was still in the liquid state. And it also needed to be slightly soluble in water in order to allow it to dissolve when it was no longer needed. And so one of the biggest breakthroughs here was the discovery of the actual material, or I guess you can call it resin. Here they settled on something called IP-S photoresist. The resin or photoresist that caused the least impact on the cell and was indeed a little bit soluble in water. Soluble enough that it gave researchers approximately 1 to 2 hours to finish printing. After this it would just dissolve. And this of course allowed them to 3D print a lot of different structures. Most of them approximately 10 micrometers in size. So apart from the tiny elephant, they also printed barcodes for cell tracking with 61 bits of information inside. In other words, it would allow scientists to track exactly what cell they're looking at by creating tiny markers inside the cell itself. And this is a really intriguing method that could dramatically improve biological research. They even took pictures of the cell dividing, and as you can see, the original cell still maintains that 3D structure. And they even explored the idea of manufacturing active optical devices, or micro lasers, inside cells. Here it becomes possible to basically create these tiny structures that then start to emit laser light themselves through the function known as Whispering Gallery Mode Resonator. Essentially trapping a light inside a curved structure, which then produces tiny tiny laser emitters of a very specific wavelength. Here's roughly what a typical structure of this would look like. But one of the most critical steps in the study was to obviously determine if the cells were still alive and if they were still viable. Because obviously it's one thing to print something, but if the cell is no longer alive, what's the point? And here we have direct information that all of the cells were viable and showed normal morphology and cell dynamics. Once again, they were able to reproduce. And here they made sure they tested everything possible just to see if any of the techniques damaged the cell. For example, the membrane penetration from the microinjection, or the sudden volume increase because of the resin droplet, or maybe even toxicity from the laser, seemed to not do anything to the cells. However, compared to the control group, where approximately 10% of cells seemed to die, after handling the cells using various techniques, there was a slight increase in deaths, up to about 50%. So basically not all cells survived the procedure, but at least half of them still did. And further research discovered that the technique that seemed to destroy the cells the most was actually the membrane penetration. So basically injecting the needle into the cell seemed to cause the most damage. But the point of the study was never to find something that's safe for cells, they were just trying to see if it was even possible. So optimizing for maximum cell survival was never really the point. They also discovered that at least some of the resins used, or some of the photoresists, seemed to be just a little bit more toxic too, so right now only one of them was least toxic. Suggesting that while technology works, there's definitely a lot of paths for refinement and for improvement. But the other concern here is of course in regards to the structure produced. Is it actually useful and is it robust enough? Especially because here, this was printed inside a cell medium, which creates a kind of a refractive index mismatch, potentially changing the object just a little bit as it's being printed. So there could be some distortions and possibly decreased resolution. But the overall conclusion from the study so far was that a lot of the displacements were relatively small, with a maximum of 0.5 micrometers, usually near the edge. And so the overall conclusion was that these structures seem to be quite viable and seem to be extremely similar to the original design. Furthermore, these deformations could eventually be completely eliminated by designing these models knowing the diffraction index. So essentially there are quite a lot of additional improvements that will probably be done in the next study. And so what's the big picture here, and I guess why is this important? Well, the ability to 3D print directly inside living cells opens up a variety of different applications by simply introducing structures through the process of phagocytosis. This opens up an enormous control over intracellular environment by allowing us to integrate synthetic structures with native biological functions, 
and even changing cellular architecture, or possibly introducing logic or mechanical components directly inside the cell. So here we're talking about like cyborg cells, I guess. But it also enables novel biochemical manipulation and sensing in order to apply controlled mechanical forces for various organelles and intracellular components. For example, printing tiny microlevers, springs, and cages can help us understand cellular division, cellular mechanics, or even allow us to introduce various microsensors inside a cell in order to be able to see everything and in order to be able to control things. But I guess more importantly, this also introduces the idea in bioelectronics and drug delivery by allowing us to fabricate a lot of different active devices inside cells that can potentially create active components or even microbots in order to repair or heal cells. Or we can also monitor various cellular activity or for example electrical activity with an extreme precision that was previously completely unattainable. But I guess for medicine, imagine printing a structure loaded with drugs right inside a bunch of cells. And here this can have the exact size, shape and position which would be a completely new level for targeted therapies. Targeting the cell issues directly instead of just introducing a bunch of drugs into the whole organism and hoping for the best. And though obviously a lot of this is still just proof of concept and still requires a lot of optimization and testing, this essentially shows us that we're finally moving from studying cells as passive entities to potentially engineering and designing them from inside out. So huge implications for synthetic biology advanced intracellular sensing, and of course helping us understand cellular dynamics, pushing the limits of biology to an entirely new level. But obviously this is just the beginning, and I'm sure we'll hear so much more in the next few years. And so once someone else creates something else using this incredible technology, we'll come back and discuss this more in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the show on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads, and can DM it directly, or by joining the channel membership that grants you early access. Alternatively, you can buy the Wonderful Person t-shirt in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.